Good afternoon, everyone. So great to see everyone here. And if you'll give me just a minute, I'm going to share some slides for our conversation. Awesome. And I'm going to introduce you meanwhile. Uh, my name is Ria Dedia. I'm the president of the NYU SPS Integrated Marketing Association. Welcome to the final session of this um, IMA Global Marketing Summit 2021. I'm going to be introducing our very last keynote speaker, Tariq Hassan, who is a dynamic consumer marketing leader with over 20 years of experience building brands for category leaders like PepsiCo, Mercedes, Johnson & Johnson, just to name a few. Among the many talents Tariq possesses, he's also known for achieving results through creating and motivating collaborative teams. Um, Without taking too much of your time, I'm going to pass the state on to Tariq Hassan, the CMO of Petco, to show us how resilience builds adaptability. Thank you, Tariq, um, for taking the time out to come to talk to us, um, and welcome. Thank you, and thank you for this fantastic opportunity. It sounds like it's been a, a great day, and I appreciate the chance to spend this last section with you all. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different bend than maybe some of the conversations that have taken place throughout today. It sounds like there's been a lot of great, rich discussion around many dimensions of the how-to of, of this changing and dynamic world of marketing. I want to pivot on that a little bit, and I want to do it in the context of recognizing the environment that you guys have been living through. And either for those of you who are planning on entering into your career in this environment or shortly behind it, um, it's hard not to have this conversation in the context of what's been taking place in the world around us. And, you know, as we continue to talk about things, um, I'll, I'll leave time at the end for questions, but you all have seen this and we've all seen it probably more than we care to, but it's hard not to have a contextual conversation without recognizing what the year has been. And it's been a year, certainly like unlike any I've ever seen, and I, I would recognize certainly unlike any of you have ever seen. Um, right out of central casting. I don't think you could account for the dimensions in a, in a, you know, in a Hollywood movie for the, that were carried out through this past year, whether it was starting with the pandemic, the social injustice elements that we face, and then certainly the more than unusual uh, democratic experience that we went through in this past fall. It's really shaped an incredibly different time. And you guys all know that, but I'm pointing to it for a slightly different reason. Um, as I get into this, because what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking to you guys about seeing past this and allowing yourselves to see what's taken place during this period is actually an opportunity. And I think a great uh, innovation motivation that will take place. I've been talking to my team about the fact that, you know, the pandemic is the new mother of invention. It's created opportunities for us to see things differently and approach things differently. And so as we move forward, and think about things, like think about the year you've had. Can any of you come up with more interesting ways to say and come up with small talk on Zoom at the start of meetings? It's, you know, you're being tested on your social levels. Um, How much I, I, more- I'm sorry to interrupt, but your um, presentation is not on uh, presentation mode. Or... It's not? Um, my apologies, let me come back in here and we're officially uh, having technical challenges, let me- let me apologize for that. I'm sorry. How about now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. My apologies, everyone. As I was saying, the, it's been it's been a, a year unlike no other. You don't need me to tell you that. You've been, you've all lived it. You've lived through the crazy experiences of, you know, trying to, you know, connect and create normalcy on Zoom. How many more hours of TikTok can you possibly watch trying somehow at times make what feels like a pretty small existence, create some reality for yourself, right? We're, we're engaged in different ways. And, and it's not like the world was perfect before the pandemic, right? We are faced, we've faced incredible challenges around this conflict and tension with technology and data. We've, we've had environmental issues that have certainly been here and just continue to be what they are. We've had a range of social issues across this country. And the reality is that trust is in short demand. And it's now moved across not only our major institutions, but a lot of that is carried over into companies and unfortunately down into our society as a whole. So this has been a challenging time and it's had an impact. 
And this is a, a reflection of your generation in terms of what the view on these things are, the places that it's created concern for you. I'll show you in data only because I think it's important that we've spent time as leaders looking at this. You guys already know this. These are the things that are concerning you, but they're important because they're different and they're reflective of both the experiences you've had in the past and the experiences you're concerned about in the future. Then they're also different because they're incredibly multidimensional and they reflect elements of not only who you guys are as people and what's important to you, but as the contributions you want to make and the, and the kind of sustenance and stability that you're looking to have in your lives. And so I've spent a lot of time in the last year, not just looking at the data, but trying to understand these features with the people that I manage and trying, because these are the critical elements that help us continue to navigate as leaders that we understand how to create an environment that allows our people to feel safe and sustainable in order to create a business that continues to be sustainable. And so it's important to recognize these things and it's had an impact. And this is just one source of data that I found around how many of you are actually reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, it's been hard and, and you all know that trying to navigate it. The bottom line is, this is just kind of sucked. Let's just call it what it is. And I think what's, what, what's been uniquely challenging from my mind is that we aren't really spending enough time understanding the warning signals behind it and making sure that we're thinking about how do we prepare for coming out of it and really allowing people to acknowledge what's happening while we're going through it. And at times, it can feel pretty difficult to find a space for yourself to clear your head, find a safe zone, and figure out where is that place of constancy and stability for yourself. I will tell you, there's a lot of conversation around the new norm. I personally refuse to use that phrase because I don't think any of us think there's anything normal about what's taking place. And to embrace that for me would be denying the ability for us to understand that we actually do have the ability to impact what we want our future state to look like, what we want our normalcy to be. And so the question is for me is not how do you normalize this supposed new normal, but rather how do we normalize the ability to acknowledge that there's nothing normal about what's going on? How do we normalize the ability to allow you to communicate it, to talk about it, to express your concerns? How do we normalize the fact that this isn't normal and that we actually need to make room to allow ourselves to feel that way? ultimately, in many ways, to grieve. Now, there's, a, there's, one, there's one box up here that might strike you unusual that I chose to put up here. I think all of us have gone through moments of feeling like this, whether it's personal or professional. I can tell you for myself, working within a, a what was it, a private company at the beginning of the pandemic and will exit as a public company post-pandemic, I can assure you this was not a ride that we actually anticipated as a company prior to the pandemic that we would be in this place. And so we've all gone through these elements. We've had to manage through these fears and these challenges and these concerns. And the one that I might feel a little bit surprising up there is surprisingly calm. And I put that one up there because I will tell you, it's what I've actually learned from my team. That despite what has been going on and the impacts that are taking place, there is a large number in my own community, and I've certainly read uh, about your community, who have been able to find a calmness in the, in the storm, in the eye of the storm. They found the ability to sort of take a breath and read into it. Now, some might say it's avoidance. I don't personally believe that. I happen to think it's actually a reflection of who you all are. The requirement to be nimble and flexible, adapt and adjust to change is actually been built into your cultural currency is who you are as a people and a generation, more so than any other generation before. The flexibility to use data and pivot with that data, the ability to use technology as a, as a fluid first language has contributed to that. So I think unlike many of us, and I'm not going to say older, you didn't think I'd actually go there, but unlike many of us, um, you all have this incredible ability and you were actually in many ways, I think, prepared for this certainly more than even you thought, and, and certainly you were more prepared than many of us who've never faced this. And so, of course, it doesn't feel normal. But the reality is, the notion of getting back to normal is a journey. And that normal 
if in fact we're basing it on where we were, we'll never return. And so we can either lament that fact or we can think about what is the opportunity behind that. And so what I'd ask you guys to do is just think about it for a second. If you were all in, we were doing this meeting live up at NYU and you were all sitting in the same chairs. Now reflect back on the generations I'm gonna show you because when has the world ever emerged from a major changing moment in its history from one version of normal to another that wasn't different? And while this will feel like a once in a lifetime thing for you and for me, these are certainly scales of things we've never seen before. If you put it in a historical context, so would a World War I have been for that generation? And you think about the kind of emergence that came out in the 20 and the growth of the economy. So it would have been the depression, the Great Depression prior to our Great Recession. And we've seen the similarities and the impact that, that had on those who went through it. But we've also seen the ingenuity and the invention and the creation that came out of the depression that also came out of the corresponding era of the Great Recession of 08. World War II and the boom and the growth and the follow through of the economy and the changing of our culture as a result of this incredible moment in time. The 60s, the social justice, the civil rights movement and the impact that that would have had on that generation. And again, the changes, the systemic changes that took place in society as a result of those and those which we realize have still not been resolved from that period. But again, if you think about if you were living during those moments, how in incredibly uh, significant that would have felt and how differentiated that would have felt in that moment. We've had other forms of pandemics. Some of those pandemics haven't been as universal as the one we're facing, but the hate that came with them, the racism that came with them, the inability to act that came with them has, all, has been present in previous experiences. And of course, influencing of the change of 9-11 as a country and what that did for us. And I already mentioned the Great Recession. And you guys know better than anybody. It shows up in your dynamics and the way you save, the way you engage in social issues, the way you respond even now when economic issues are in place. You watched, you learned, and it's now shaped and impacted who you are. But the point is, through all of these moments, has come opportunity. And so, wow, I just kind of like threw all this stuff at you guys and frankly, my head's spinning and you guys are probably sitting there saying, I hope this guy isn't gonna continue to be such a downer. Like this is starting to bum me out. I'm not. What I'm here to tell you is that through these elements come incredible opportunities and they were happening even before this. So how about some good news? Well, I happen to think through this craziness, is a tremendous ability for change. And we're starting to see it because at the end of the day, we're humans and humans have the ability to adapt and flex and learn and innovate. And we evolve. And you've all been through an evolution of what you've experienced in the last little while, but guess what? So are the companies that you've been, that you will eventually go work out and go to work for and shape. We've changed things like never before. If I think about my own company, when the pandemic hit, we were testing basic technology like buy online, pick up in store. We were testing that in 25 stores. The pandemic hit, the test was over. We went national within a week. We had just started to talk about same day delivery. It's now fully in place nationwide. We were just starting to talk about elements like repeat delivery for our customers. It's now fully in place. We were discussing the idea of putting a subscription plan together to take care of pets, all their basic needs through a monthly package. We were looking at launching it in late 21 to early 22. We launched in the fall of 20 because the health and wellness needs and the considerable number of people who were at home with their pets and thinking about the needs they had had changed. So out of this craziness comes the ability for what we do as humans. It sparks awesomeness. It creates creativity. It, some, it allows us to adapt and persist and drive innovation. And you guys know that more than any generation. And you will. It's not a question of if. You will be the generation that comes out of this and reinvents from your experiences here. And you've seen it before. You're a generation that sees the world completely different. And we know 
that those experiences will motivate you to turn right when others would have turned left to go work for this company and you'll invent instead or you'll entrepreneur instead or you'll go into these companies like mine and you'll help us drive change because of those things. I guess my point I'm trying to work on is encouraging you to do what you've done. You've been empowered with technology. You've demanded direct relationships with our brands. But the reality is that technology is you've demanded direct relationships with everything, with each other, with brands, on issues. You've moved through them. And you've leveraged this technology as a tool to drive change, to drive improvements. And I'd like to think that we're as companies brilliant to do it, but the reality is we've been responding to your demands. We've been responding to your behaviors. And so marketing, in many ways, we are changing faster than ever, not just because of the enablement of the technology we have, not just because of the access to the data and what it allows us to do to become more personalized and more engaged, but because of the demand and because of the way you guys respond and the way you guys engage and the needs that you have. They're like never seen before, and because of the speed at which things are happening, your impatience drives innovation with us as well. So frankly, I happen to think we are in one of the most exciting times of change in marketing. What we are seeing happen on the collision of what our ability is to leverage data from a performance marketing perspective, and what I believe this past year has reaffirmed something our industry needed desperately, which is to get back to infusing around that performance and that data, the human spirit and storytelling, and making sure that brands actually are breathing, breathing and living, not just what the algorithm tells us. It, because it's when you take the collection and the collaboration of the human mind and the, and, and the intimacy of data, not just the raw factor of data, that magic happens. And you've seen what happens. You've seen the change, what happens when technology is completely redefining industries. Think about it. Everyone's private driver, the world's largest taxi company owns no cabs. The world's largest content company makes no content or at least very minimal content. Some of their subsidiaries you'd argue do, but they don't make any, you guys do it. World's largest hotel owns no real estate. Because great brands redefine, they're redefining business forever because they don't just look at business. They look at human need, they look at human behavior, they look at human demand, and they look at human opportunity. And when they do it, they create emotional connection through shared values and belief. And that's why you've heard us all starting to talk about, and I'm sure you heard it throughout the day today, the role of purpose. Purpose isn't new for us as an industry to start to understand what to do with it but it is new that it's at the core of what we do, that it, we get asked questions by shareholders around what we're doing with our ESG strategy. What are we doing around our diversity and inclusion? What are we doing to bring our purpose to life in the context of what we're doing commercially? And you guys are a generation who not only demand that, that answer, you measure your dollars with us with that answer whether we get them or whether we don't, whether you're loyal to us or whether you're not. And so you have also fundamentally impact and changed the way we approach brands with that in mind. And so as I move into this next section, what I'd actually like to do is talk to you about how we approach building great brands. And many of the themes that you've heard today in terms of how you go about driving great businesses, because I actually think there's hints in the way we produce great businesses and great brands for how we as people can move forward from here. And so I'd ask you to think about this section, maybe it's a little bit of brand therapy as a way to think about what you need to move forward. There are hints in what great brands have already shown us you can do to move forward. Great brands understand they have the power to influence behavior. You guys demonstrate this in so many ways and frankly, in so many ways more than previous generations have and they build reputation. Because now, I can't, when I first came in the industry, you could be protected from this a little bit. The worst thing you were dealing with was, was the press making you know, an article here and there. But the news cycle would pass and it would be done. You didn't have the extension of social media to carry it. You didn't have the extension of social media to amplify it. So now, if you're not managing your reputation, someone else is gonna manage it for you. 
I would argue the same absolutely holds true. And you guys know this better than anyone by the way you not only manage your human reputation, but your social reputation. Great brands have the ability and they are changing the way you want people to see, hear, and feel about you. A great brand manages for that. It develops it and it controls and it measures and it thinks about those things. I'd ask you guys to think the same about yourselves as you went to the world. It defines you. It's the voice you create for yourself, the language, the tone, the appearance, how you show up. These things have never been more important. They've always been around. And for a while, frankly, as marketers, we lost our way on some of these because we thought the answer was just simply in the data. But if you look at some of the most successful the direct to consumer businesses, that had immediate success, the challenges they faced in the long term when others entered their categories was their ability to differentiate and be defined differently that people would actually care about them beyond the first initial connection with them. And so you've seen a resurgence of ensuring we understand what that purpose and that storytelling is. Why? Because it differentiates you. How are you going to stand out? When you go in to do these interviews and look for your next job, how are you going to differentiate yourself? What's your brand to deliver against that? Well, we asked after ourselves the same things. And I work with a company that has fundamentally redefined who we are because we knew the brand we were that got us here 50 years later could not be the brand we could be tomorrow. And so we consequently made the decision. We declared we are no longer a retailer. Yes, we have 1,500 locations. Yes, we have an e-commerce site. Yes, we have 15,000 employees that are in there to serve pet parents. And of course, we sell merchandise. But our true north is about becoming a pet health and wellness company. Our true north for how we make decisions shifted from conversations with vendors, what the dollars were telling us by category, to making decisions in categories that were based on if it was right for the pet, then it would be right for our business. It's what allowed us to take steps to differentiate ourselves and take $100 million out of our category in order to remove preservatives and additives from our, from our food lines. And in turn, have the innovation to replace that $100 million with a better standard of food, with a better standard of nutrition. And actually, well, in the end, what we did was exceeded that number by 150 million to grow the business. It's about understanding that if you're committed to doing these things, you take steps like removing shock collars from your shelves and you make decisions that you focus on positive training because that's a better way to treat a pet than the negative training impact would. So it's understanding what's going to differentiate you and then having the courage to act on those things. Because it's understanding if you do those things, it's what connects us. And again, if you look at the buying that connects all of you and why the role of things like TikTok and other platforms like Clubhouse have worked, it's us seeking that ability to connect with others like us that think like we do. That behavior is forcing business and brands to also think and rethink how we're going to behave in a similar fashion. Because if we don't engage in that community and if we don't engage in a way that's authentic and real to that, you all see through it and you all have significant buying power. So we're transforming. Great brands, they transform from expression to experience, right? And the notion that you have an expression, I like that, that's kind of interesting, but an experience where I can engage with you and connect with you and feel you, that's where you find love and loyalty. And so we're starting to do those things and think about it. It's what's led us to move into developing things like a subscription program that allows you to pay for a monthly full care of your pet. It's what's allowing us to develop insurance programs for pets that are based on the notion that no family should have to make the hardest choice between whether they can pay their rent or have to put their pet down for medical bills. And so we'll be launching an entire area around financial accessibility to pet to vet care and affordable vet care. It's understanding that that connection, that's what creates lifetime value. And having companies think about lifetime value as opposed to quarter to quarter to revenue. And of course, we have to answer to the street on those things, but you've got to do it. It's not an either or anymore. It's a both. We have to deliver those things today while thinking about a greater long-term value tomorrow and how you maintain that connection with your customer to do it. So they're built with a purpose. And the reality is 
you guys are built with purpose in your DNA. Never before have we seen a generation of professionals that come out and are looking to work and demand that they're going to work for companies that have a human compass, that have a purpose, that have a direction that can speak to the greater good that they're building. And never before have we seen the failure of companies that breach that trust and reflect the inability to do that. You guys have this already wired into you. It's an amazing, amazing thing that I think will create the next generation of incredible companies, but I think it will transform existing companies today. And in fact, it already is. And it's not just about feel good. It's also about investor value. If you look, and this has been quantified, companies that have a purpose perform better. Their return on investment is higher. And it matters, not only because it feels good, but because it actually delivers performance for the company. Purpose is an amazing thing. It conveys your belief, but it also conveys the action that you will take. I literally sort of grabbed a, a slew of different brands here. Pick your own, define what it is. For us, we talk about going as far for pets as they would go for each other, because if it's right for the pet, it's right for the business. It's what we do. Ultimately, it's because what gets people to evangelize and create your brand with you. That's the other amazing power. You, you, the, the, word, the one breath, that community can take your brand down and the next breath of that, that community can lift your brand up and make it completely impenetrable. Make you the best brand in the world. To do this, I would challenge all of you to approach what we do in business for yourself. I talk a lot to my team about the intimacy of data. So develop a complete mind. This is a Da Vinci quote. Develop a complete mind. Study the science of art. Study the art of science. Learn how to see and realize that everything connects to everything else. The data won't give you signals to where those connections are, but it won't teach you everything. And that's why Google even talks about they use data for the next best question, not the next best answer. There is deep art in the science of data, and there is deep science in the art of understanding human behavior and what we do to connect with. Here's the good part of the good news. You guys have so many of these skills already in place. You have been preparing your entire lives to be able to engage and lead and do the things that I'm talking about. So many of these things are already developed inside of who all of you guys are, and you have a head start leverage them and then bring them to life just like I'm showing here because this is where the innovation of our future will come from. Bezos talks about your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And he's right. We see this in a lot of the measurement we do around customer satisfaction. We see it around trust. We see it around reputation. We see it about brand love. I guess the question I would turn around on all of you today is after all of the craziness that you've been through, after the immunizations, after we reemerge and start to live the life that we all aspire to live again, I'd ask all of you to think about the question that you leave yourself, which is what will they say about you when you leave the room? I thank you all for your time. And with that, I will pass it over to May. And I think we're going to open up for some questions. Yes, thank you, Tarek. This is wonderful. We love your talk and I love how are you connecting the dots um, in our human history to show that what, it, what we are experiencing now is something that humankind has been able to survive and evolve through our resilience. So I think this is the perfect way to wrap up our journey today. Uh, and for those of you who haven't been here today, my name is May and I'm the marketing chair of the IMA. Uh, so we got a lot of questions from the Q&A box. So the first question is that you mentioned the rebranding stories of Petco, which is very amazing. So what about um, rebranding and pivoting of one's personal brand instead of a company's brand? So I, I'll tell you the, the model for doing it. it's the same and I'm, and, I, and I'm really excited. You've only seen the beginning of what we've done to rebrand Petco. Um, keep your eyes open the end of March. You're gonna see the official relaunch of our brand in a way that I think reflects a lot of what I was talking about. Um, I have no problem giving you guys the hint of where we're heading, but the, the whole 
focus of where we're going to where we're heading in our brand repositioning is the notion of it's what we'd want if we were pets because we believe that an understanding of the pet parent these are these are family members and if we and they can't speak for themselves they can't advocate for themselves and so we have to do that for them so you'll see us do that i would tell you the recreation of your brand is the same thing um i would encourage you to approach it in the sort of same systematic way you would in some of the assignments you've taken and developing the brand sit down and do that with for yourself go do the qualitative research who are you asking are you speaking to mentors about your strengths are you speaking to mentors about your opportunity um, I'm, I'm right now in a, a leadership development course because I, I believe we continue to have to continue to develop as leaders. And I'm working right now on a model called Ikigai, which is a, a Japanese philosophy of looking at how you develop your purpose. And it looks at the things you're really good at. And it looks at the things you love. And it looks at the contributions that the world needs. And it looks at what the value they would bring because the value is important. Um, I'd encourage you to look, look for that. It's a really simple construct to ask questions about who you want to be. Um, the other thing is I think you're entering into a world where developing a brand when I started my career, um, I'm disappointed to say it back then, it, at the time didn't mean that you were necessarily were allowed to bring the complete version of, of who you are. I think that has changed tremendously. Um, I'm a leader who, who works really hard to ensure we continue to drive the notion of authentic leadership and the ability to bring your complete self and your own vulnerability to the workplace. You are a generation that will demand that and, and you will continue to spur us as leaders to do that. Um, and then it's hard work. You gotta go do the hard stuff. You gotta go find out from people the things that you need to evolve as a brand. Believe me, when we made the shift to become a health and wellness company, I had to listen to a lot of things about why as a company that was gonna be hard for us to do. What we didn't do well and still don't do particularly well at times in customer service. We have a website that's good on its way to great but it's not there. So you have to go and hear the things that you need to work on and you need to have trusted advisors who are not afraid to actually tell you what those things are. And then you wanna develop a list of on those, which of those really you do need to evolve to become great and which of those you need to leave behind. I'm a, I'm a leader who believes you don't spend a lot of time asking your talent to develop their biggest challenges. Those are, that's not where I get the best out of people. I'm a leader who believes you go after the things that people do amazingly well, and you identify a couple of those challenges they need to bring with them to continue to do really well. You need to understand what those things are and be prepared to do the hard work. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, so our next question is, so sentiment um, of a brand has become the center stage of marketing. So what are some of the ways that Petco is utilizing to monitor and measure um, sentiments for your brand? It, that is a fantastic question. I'm on the journey of doing something. I also did when I was at Bank of America, where we are looking at both, um, we're looking at our brand consideration, the elements that drive consideration to a brand, but we're also measuring our customer satisfaction uh, in very, very deep methods. We use, a, we use a company called Medallia that helps us understand across transactional moments, customer satisfaction. And we're also starting to understand how important those moments actually are. So in one breath, we understand customer satisfaction, where we're doing it well, where we're not. We understand how important those things are, how important they're not. But the thing that we're now doing, and this is what I've done in my past life, is we are developing an inner relationship to understand the mathematics of, of those customer satisfaction moments, how many of those positively or negatively impact brand consideration as well. Why are we doing this? Because I'm moving to a place where we will quantify what the increase of consideration of a brand is in marketplace value. Why? Because as marketers, it allows us to shift the conversation around the fact that everything we do is to get up every day and drive a brand, not for soft measures, but for business growth. And so we're, we're in the process right now of, of establishing a direct understanding of what is the customer satisfaction? What's the impact on our brand consideration? And as we move or decrease that consideration, what is the impact on in the marketplace in terms of its dollar value? Got it. Um, so I think this relates to our next question. Um, so our previous speaker talked about that we marketers should also recognize ourselves as 
consumers, on the other hand. Um, so what do you think that we should recognize this duality of our roles and how do we leverage this advantage of being a marketer on the one hand and also being a consumer on the other hand in, in our day-to-day decision-making processes? Look, I, m- my belief is that those are not necessarily opposite hands. I actually think they're, they're collectively. You are quintessentially the single most important advocate of the customer in your company. If you're fortunate enough, that mindset moves across the company and you have partners and other folks in the organization who embrace that. And certainly um, that, that's, that's true of what we're doing, but your customer is counting on you to think like a customer, to act like a customer, to advocate like a customer and bring that into the work that you're doing. The challenge is to ensure that you do that in such a way that in your outputs, again, are focused on driving the outcome of the business, right? The feel good's, the feel good's good, but you've got to make sure it leads to a so what and what the issue of the business. And then the other thing that we do as marketers is we have to snap off the insights that we learn about customers, package them up and deliver them to the doorstep of our other partners in a way that adds value for what they have to do. When you do that, when, a, when your other partners, whether it's in finance, whether it's in operations, whether in my case, store operations, or in product development, I think about our, our e-commerce and our digital capabilities and what we're trying to build there. My ability to help my partners understand and advocate on behalf of the customer leads to a different development outcome for that customer. If what I provide my partners makes their job more difficult, then you're gonna have a a challenging time. Um, And so we face a really interesting challenge of listening to customers, translating what it is that they're, they're telling us, determining what are the things that we need to frankly not listen to at times, and how do we then move those elements across the organization? If those things are perceived as a marketing only domain, you will have limited success versus if it pervades the organization. Got it. Thank you. This is very insightful. And in the interest of time, I'll be giving you the last question of the session, also of the day. So what are the, some of the most important resources that you rely on to keep yourself up to date and also learn about all the um, happenings in the market and also in the whole world? Um, one of my most significant things I, I do, I haven't been able to do for a year, which is travel. <laughs> um, I grew up in the world of international business. And one of the reasons I've always loved being connected to international markets, whether that's through work or whether that's through my own personal life is you get a different perspective and a different approach uh, to thinking about things as you move through through different markets. Um, and so I'm looking forward to being able to log some miles to do that again. Um, I wanna talk about mentorship and the importance of mentorship. Um, and that doesn't go away as you get older. It gets harder to continue to maintain, but it's, it's equally critical. Um, For individuals, and then I'll tell you an industry element, I would tell you, it goes back to your rebranding question as well, build your board of directors. Who is your personal board of director? Who's on that board? Why are they on that board? How different are they? What source of information they provide? Some of them will be tactical and technical. Some of them will be personal and leaderly, but build that. Understand who your resources are you can tap into. Um, the challenge that we face as marketers today and in going the technical space is we have access to a tremendous amount of data. The question becomes, do you know how to organize that data? Do you know how to limit the data so that it actually doesn't overwhelm you, but you actually overwhelm it? Um, and so we're using different partners, um, like I mentioned with Medallia, uh, like I mentioned with some of the other companies that we use for tracking or for how we're organizing and connecting different data systems to to help support how we're approaching either innovation or engagement. Those third-party partners become really critical to give you a different perspective and different view. Um, I happen to be a believer of using third-party and outside agencies, uh, whether it's in research, whether it's our advertising, et cetera, because I think they bring a different perspective to us as well as our in-house capabilities that we build. Um, I was gonna say I read, but increasingly these days I say I listen. <laughs> I'm much more of a podcast and uh, book listener than I am an actual uh, reader. After uh, all my life, I've, I've uh, 
embraced my my own dyslexic journey and so I listen because I'm a better listener than reader but I'm I'm pretty ferocious in terms of the different podcasts I listen to and they are a very different array and they range from everything from the arts to the sciences to the to the world of business um and then just get out experience touch you know engage and and learn from other people you just you have to just go experience things yeah love it love it i love how you're recognizing that we humans need to engage need to get out there and engage with each other so thank you once again Tarek. um uh, thank you so much for closing up our summit with so much positivity um so i'm now gonna hand it over to our academic director at nyusps michael diamond to close up our first ever virtual ima summit thank you man it was an absolute pleasure and honor michael thank you Tarek, uh, just a quick note of thanks to you a very inspiring way to end uh, the day uh, I'm going to leave the full thanks, uh, you know, to Ria, who's going to close us out a little bit later. But I just do want to personally offer my thanks to Ria and all of her team at the IMA for curating what I'm sure everyone who's been with us uh, would, would say was been an extraordinary and engaging event. Um, Ria asked me uh, to summarize the entire day's worth of content. And um, I think that that is... Um, uh, a task that no sane person should really attempt. <laughs> but uh, being a marketing prof, I, I felt compelled to come up with uh, an acronym or, and, and, and found uh, five C's. So, I, I mean, clearly what we all heard today, what I saw was this beautiful fabric of interrelated and multi-threaded ideas. But I think you could situate them around five themes, perhaps. And so I'm gonna offer my five C's, context, congruence, careers, courage, and change. Uh, so by context, uh, all of the speakers uh, made a point to encourage our students and other participants to embrace and understand the change around us. Yes, the, 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 what's going on around us, a drastically shifting landscape, ongoing erosion of trust, turbulence of the pandemic, pandemic uh, ongoing imperative of solving social justice and sustainability issues we touched on, and really trying to understand how all of those uh, contextual things are driving and enabling new business, new business, new business models, but not just shaping the new, but actually reinventing the old, which I found was a fascinating ob observation. And whether you're com comfortable talking about the new normal uh, or not, uh, the question of how this context and this environment has shifted and changed and how permanent that is, is gonna force all of us to think more about scenario planning and multiple possible outcomes than traditional planning mode that marketers found themselves in. So the first C is context. The second is congruence. Um, a lot of discussion around uh, congruence in a professional setting, especially in the context of purpose and the idea of how you link good intentions and strong execution. We heard about deeds over creeds and we heard Augie's injunction to lead with change before the communications. Uh, but it's not just, I think, in a professional sense that this congruence uh, was recommended and celebrated, but also at the level of personal congruence, yeah? So how do you bring your authentic, whole, holistic self to work every day? How do we capture that internal congruence? A third C would be careers. And for many of us, many of our students, that's what we're focused on. I thought Lex did an amazing job of reminding us that while marketing hasn't changed that much, by which I think he meant the fundamentals of marketing hasn't changed that much, marketers must change. And whether you think it's a T shape or an M shape or a U shape, the point is that you should identify the pillars and the skills uh, and the things that you're gonna need to anchor your practice in. Uh, we heard about enthusiasm, curiosity, flexibility, we heard about financial acumen and the languages of business. And we heard a lot about data. Uh, and as Tariq just said, using data as a fluid first language, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thought. Fourth, we heard about courage. And I think Patricia sum, summarized this as well as any when she said, we're reminded that you can be bold and courageous and at the same time be respectful. And I like that idea that uh, courage doesn't have to be arrogant, that courage can be respectful. And finally, change. Picking up on a theme, uh, Tariq closed out the day with a very provocative question. 
you know, how do we change the world? And it's, and it's been clear throughout the day that it, all of our speakers believe foundationally that in order to change the world, we need to change how we act in it and how we relate to that world ourselves. You need to change the way you want people to see, hear, and feel about you, is what Tarek said. And he, and he uh, I think, uh, provocatively suggested, your impatience drives innovation. Uh, that will be a force of change. So the question on everybody's minds, hopefully, uh, is, is, is also how are we going to impact the culture and influence the change in the organizations? How do we take more of a leadership perspective as marketers? So Ria, those were some of the themes that I captured. Um, I hope they resonated with many of you. And uh, thanks again for an absolutely extraordinary day uh, from start to finish. Thank you, Michael. I think that was a wonderful summary of today. And I am feeling, uh, I'm leaving feeling very inspired at the end of it. Um, so on behalf of my entire team, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and making this, this um, summit the success that it is. Uh, we're so grateful for the amazing speakers that carved out the time to come and talk to us and inspire us today. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize everybody that put in all of their hard work without whom um, this event wouldn't have been possible. Um, if this event was in person, um, you would have seen everybody and recognized everybody that was running around and making this happen. But I guess this team truly um, adapted through the unpredictable. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the fantastic members of iCrossing team, Ebru, Rosa, Yoli, and their entire team um, who helped us design and develop this amazing interactive experience with the portal, um, which, uh, by the way, is the place where this event is being hosted on. Um, the amazing superhero, Professor Federico Salviti, who has been our knight in shining armor. He supported us and this team and me through each step of the way, um, day and night. He truly is an amazing mentor and a wonderful person. Um, thank you for equipping us and empowering us to make this event a success. Um, the IMC department, uh, Michael Diamond, um, thank you for supporting us and pushing this event, event to its fullest. And more importantly, Natalie, who constantly was there to provide us with all the logistical and operation support we needed at any time. So thank you, Natalie, for picking up all of those calls. Um, Mark Somnole, who, was our, who is our club advisor for helping us shape the foundational pillars on which all IMA events were then built on. So thank you for helping and being our soundboard. Um, last but more importantly, I would like to thank the team. I have a picture that I can pull up so that people can see and recognize them. Um, am I sharing the right screen? Michael? Okay, um, so this is the amazing team behind um, this event. I'm gonna start off by thanking the Christina, the graphic design chair who did this fabulous aesthetic and all this design communication who made this event look beautiful. Irem, the social media chair, the person behind creating the most engaging, witty, interactive community on social media. Omar, um, oh, and before I forget, if you don't follow us on social media, please do on NYU IMA uh, on Instagram. Omar for supporting the event logistics and bringing his experience and wisdom to help us define success and to achieve it. Paywen, who is the treasurer, helped us lay down the foundational research to design this summit and also optimally utilize our financial resources. Nimisha for making sure that each and every stakeholder is always updated on the same page and making sure that our event is on every digital asset and it gains the full promotional momentum that it did. Wa, it's very safe, who is Wa is the vice president. Um, it's safe to say that she is the reality check, the soundboard that kept us all focused at all times. She is the, she, fleshes out the unnecessary and keeps the necessary to make this event a success. Metab, who is the communication chair, who beautifully crafted all the messages that went out to you. Um, and she's the reason why we had over 700 registrations today. Lastly, 
May and Tita, who are the foundational pillars of this event, the most important people um, who worked with me day in, day out, um, who supported and dedicated themselves to the success of this event, left no st stones unturned. May on the marketing strategy front, who's the marketing chair, and Tita on the logistical and operational end, operations end. I'm so grateful for this wonderful team and um, this was a wonderful opportunity and thank you so much um, NYU School of Professional Studies for giving it to us and making this event come to life. Um, I would like to thank you all um, for attending this event and um, before I forget, um, NYU Wasserman is hosting a networking um, networking event for integrated marketing students. Um, if you haven't registered, there's a banner on top of the, um, in the portal on top, which says networking. If you click on it, it'll lead you to uh, the handshake link for registration. It was, you were supposed to register before noon today. Um, and the mixer will begin at 3 p.m. right after the summit um, closes. So at 3 p.m. you can um, go to that link. It will lead you to another Zoom link. You probably would have gotten an email. This is only for NYU SPS student um, and it's hosted by Wasserman. So uh, thank you so much. And with that, I would like to end officially end the summit. Um, hope you have a great day.